means we're, we keep it rolling. Yes, sir. See, that complies. That's good. We're now joined by Purdue head coach Matt Painter. Midway through this 30-minute question and answer session, we'll be joined by Zach Eady and Mason Gillis. Coach, would you like to tell us how things are going today so far? And then we'll start taking questions. Yeah, obviously, um, you know, it's a quick, a little bit quicker turnaround for us, so for everybody. Um, but just, you know, watching the game last night and watching a little bit of tape and just trying to talk to as many people as, as possible. Um, you know, the most important team is your team. I think anybody would say that at this point. But um, UConn is a very, very good basketball team, very good defensively, run a lot of really good stuff offensively, probably going to steal a couple things. Uh, not I'm going to steal a couple things um, for next year. But um, he's just done a phenomenal job, you know, to, to win the national championship and then to be back in this position. I think there's a lot of things that come with ultimate success that's hard to do what they've been able to do and to be able to piece a team together and be able to compete and win multiple championships in their conference, in the tournament, and to keep that focus in, in the way they've won. You know, um, you know, there's been some teams that have hung in there with them and then they've separated from them. And there's been some other teams that have just gotten flat out blitzed. And, and so it's, um, you know, you have to be on your P's and Q's. You got to take care of the basketball. You got to be able to rebound. You got to be able to be good in transition. Um, if you take bad shots and you turn the ball over, you're, you're in deep trouble. It's a quick two or a quick three um, for them. They're probably the best I've seen um, in a long, long time in being able to take your mistake and, and make you pay for it at times when you make mistakes. Other teams, they're probably going to make you pay, but it's just not automatic. It just seems once that happens, it's it, it's automatic. So um, you just you know can't can't have those type of turnovers and those types of bad shots. Um, then you got to be able to guard them. You know, if you do those things, you got a chance. It doesn't guarantee success. You got a chance, but if you don't, you know you, you don't have a chance. Our first question, coach, is going to come to the right side of the room. I think that's Brian under the cap. Hey, Matt, Brian Hamilton from The Athletic. In terms of personnel and roster construction, you look at you guys, UConn, then go back to, like, Kansas, Virginia, Villanova. What have we learned or what should we have learned wins and works these days? Right. Um, I, I think everybody is in a, a different uh, situation. I think the landscape is what it is, but – I think first and foremost, can you recruit nationally? Can you recruit your area? Like sometimes when you take a job, everybody always says, oh, we're gonna recruit our backyard. But if your backyard is not very fertile and you don't have a lot of players there, like what are you really supposed to do? Just take the best players that aren't quite good enough. So when you're an elite school and you've put yourself in a position like a UConn or a Kansas who's done it for many, many years, you know, it, you can get involved with a lot of people. You know, what, what we've been able to do, you know, through our losses in recruiting is understand, you know, who we can get and who we can't get and then just be smarter about it. And then we've really recruited towards the production and the functionality of our system and what, we, what we're trying to do. Now, with that being said, you still have to be able to get your guys, right? You got to have Braden Smith. Got to have Fletcher Lawyer. Got to have obviously Zach Eady. Got to have Biggie Swan again. You got to have Carson Edwards. Then that's when role definition is so important. So a lot of people that are picking out of the portal and, and doing that, they're trying to get the most talented guys if they're getting multiple guys. So if you say someone's got to get six or seven guys, there's no way six or seven guys are going to be successful. It's impossible, right? But if you're in our situation where you got to get a guy or two, you know, Cam Spencer is a great example. You know, you're blending in to what they already had, and then what he brings fits what they do, especially how tough he is, how, you know, how he has a great feel, how he understands offensively. So that's a little bit different than somebody just going into the spring and then their, you know, their roster management is two-thirds of their team, right? 
And, you, you, and, and we've always seen that before this with when somebody gets a new job. So now if you get a new job in this landscape, you know, you could sign 13 people, right? And, and, and so that's, that's a whole lot different. So it kind of depends on who you are, where you're at, who you can get, who you can't get. Um, and what is, is tough is name, image, and likeness wasn't supposed to be put in place for whoever's got the most money gets the best players. But if you kind of want to be truthful about what's going on in the, the part of our business that stinks, that was happening before. So now those teams that were doing that before now get to do it through name, image, and likeness, and it's a double whammy because they're not just getting their name, image, and likeness money. They're getting their money that they were getting before that was illegal. So the people that do it the right way, you know, you can get mad about it all you want, but you need to keep your focus on yourself. So that's what we've tried to do. Keep our focus on ourselves, and if that's what you want to do, like, good for you. We can still go get good basketball players, mesh them together, and have a good product. We have about 11 questions in the queue right now. Let's go up front to the left. Dan? Yeah, hey, Matt. Uh, Dan Walton, USA Today. You know, as much as you have to talk about and live in and in and, and some ways get defined by tough tournament losses, how do you as a coach, you know, sort of keep focus on just being good every year and the value in, right. in what your program has has done year after year. Right, just try to keep working, try to be honest about your mistakes, try to be honest about um, just everything. You know, it's an inexact science, you know, at times, especially from a recruiting standpoint. But, you know, learn from, you know, your tough losses and don't run from them and face them. And so that's what we've tried to do. You know, we've been to that second weekend a lot, but we haven't been able to get through it. We only got to the Elite Eight once before this. and so. Um, you know, just keep plugging, you know, feel good about like what you're doing, feel good about your convictions. And when it gets right down to the game, our tough losses the last four years, don't turn the basketball over. Don't go four for 22 from three um, or whatever those numbers are like, you know, you know, you, but I know this, if we don't turn the basketball over and we still go four for 22, or whatever those numbers exactly are, we're, we're probably going to win those games. So like last night was a, was an outlier game for us. You know, we had high level um, turnovers, but we went 10 for 25 from three and we still established Zach Eady, even though he didn't have like, like an unbelievable game for him. You know, those numbers are, are very average, you know, you know, for him, they're not average for everybody else. But yeah, just trying to do those things and, uh, you know, stay functional in what we're doing. Second row, left side. Hey, Coach, Claire Hanna with TSN. I'm sure you're trying to keep a lot of consistency in your prep as you prepare for this game, but have you noticed a different energy or vibe from your players as you're on the verge of this national championship um, game? Not really. Um, it's, you know, obviously it's a quick turnaround. So, like, when you're, you know, you go to your post-game meal, you know, you go to breakfast, you watch film, and here we are. So it's not a lot of time in terms of what we're doing. Um, you know, they, they understand what we're up against. They understand we haven't played anybody like UConn. They're, they're not fools. We have cable where we're from. So, like, we're, we're very familiar. I think that's the number one thing of, you know, not fearing your opponent but respecting your opponent. We have a lot of respect for UConn. They have great individual players. They have a great coach. Um, and, and, and so understand it. Like, absorb that. Take that in. And, uh, you know, that, that's where you have to start. But we, we've played great teams all year. And just like when we dive into their personnel, whether that's Gonzaga, whether that's Tennessee, whether that's Marquette, whether that's Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan State, on down the line, you know, respect your opponent, respect those coaches, respect the players, understand how they've really beat people, how they've really dominated people. And I think the word dominate comes out with UConn, right? They've dominated people. They haven't dominated like the bad teams. They've, they've dominated some great teams. And then with that, how do they go about it and just study it but it's easier to study and, and like look at than it is, you know, you, you got to be able to do your job. You got to be able to embrace the physicality, keep them out of transition, keep them off the glass, keep them out of their sets and what they want to do. Um, you know, it's easy to watch and understand that, but it's, it's very, very hard to do. And that's our challenge. Coach, we'll go to the right side, second row, Chris. Coach Chris Bennett with ESPN. We've talked about like what you learned after last year, getting better at the three, being more athletic, quicker. Would you be here today if you didn't have those scars from last year? And if someone had told you you're going to have to go through it in order to get to this place, right. would you have taken that deal? Yeah, to answer your last question, I, I think um, 
I think to get in this position, you would take it, right? You would say, hey, like, let's, let's take that loss to get here. I'd prefer not to do that, though. Um, the problem with a really tough loss when it ends your season is you don't have another game. Like when you blow a game on January 16th, you just play on January 21st. You know, and you get that taste out of your mouth, you get it back, like you can, but when you have a loss at the end of the season, you know, you have to sit in it and you have to take it. And, and some of that um, um, is healthy in a sense. You're just, it's why I try to keep, um, you know, our players from going into coaching because there's such a level of misery. You know, there's, there's so many good things and I'm so glad I did it because of the relationships, but I don't like, you know, you don't choose how you feel. I always compare it to dreams. Like, you know, why is this person in my dream that doesn't, he shouldn't be here or whatever. You don't pick your dreams. Your dreams are your dreams, but we all understand some of our dreams are nightmares too. And you don't pick those either. And so that piece of it, of being able to have to go to, through it and feel that, I think helps you get on edge, helps you to be a little sharper. But um, I think you only need to do it once though. We've done it multiple times. Um, what was your first question again? I apologize. I, I don't think so. I think, you know, I, when you make a statement like, would we be here without Zach Eady? No. You know, would you be here without Braden Smith? No. And as you start to trickle down as a coach, you realize the importance. I have two guys that didn't play for me last night, um, Caleb First and Ethan Morton, and they started for me the year before. And with their attitudes and the way they've handled things and the way they've been professional as young people, we wouldn't be here with them either, without them either. Like, they're, they're a big part of our team, and it pains me that they don't play. It's really hard for me as a person to do that because I wanted to work for each individual. But at the end of the day, I have to make decisions that are best, uh, you know, for Purdue. And it's, and it's also best for circling around Zach and it's in circling around Braden and our, and our core guys and how they do it. We've really went to a more offensive front to where we're putting as much skill out on the court as possible. So I'm very appreciative of those guys and just appreciative of the guys are on our scout team. Like people that come to Purdue, they don't come to be on the scout team. They come to play. And then when you don't and then you have to be on the scout team and you have to do those things, man, and, and to be able to swallow your pride and do it and try to help us. Like, you know, I have a lot of respect for that, and I appreciate those guys. Coach, we'll head up front. Gene? Hey, Matt. Gene Wong, The Washington Post. What similarities can you draw from uh, the journey you're on compared to what Virginia did in 2019? Or do you look at it something different because each year and each team have right. their own unique story? No, I, I think that that's actually an accurate narrative. Sometimes people will pick up narratives that, that, that you know, out of thin air instead of doing their work. This, this is actual, the right narrative. Um, the thing I grab from it more than anything is just the humility of Tony Bennett and how he handled it with class. I think anytime you can take it, you know, you gotta be able to take it. You know, when you're a little kid, you know, that was always the line, you know, you know, can, you, know you can dish it out, but you can't take it, right? That's the old saying. Um, and we're all that way as young people. Like, we, you know, we, we can say whatever we want, but then it hurts when it comes back your way, but, you know, use that in a positive spin. But more than anything, what stood out to me was when we had that loss, you know, we joined that club with Virginia and Tony Bennett, and he had just gotten beat, I think, by, by Furman that day. And, you know, you're, you're at a low when you, when you have tough losses like that. And for him to think of us and to think of me and to reach out to me on that day was, you know, that was great. So from just a humanity standpoint, right just like you know there, there there are some good people out there um that are thinking about others even when they're down and out and um once again it's not who you are right it's not who you are it's what you do for a living it means a whole lot but it's not who you are and, and try to keep that in perspective up front and center you see bartley boiler upload rivals matt last year you talked a lot about how your team lost confidence this season it comes to seems to be the opposite regardless of results there's been confidence after losses what about your team this year and then in regards to Braden yesterday just what did you see from confidence in him and confidence in your team regardless right. of results well I think you know through confidence for us um, I, I think a lot of that gets drawn from how people shoot the basketball right I think that's a not necessarily how they play basketball but how they shoot the basketball. And I think when you miss shots and you're used to making them and you turn the ball over and you're used to not, 
And that combination, I think that combination for Braden yesterday was really hard for him to take in. I thought our team did a good job, our staff did a good job of just keeping him positive. He's a big piece of what we do. He runs the show for us. So that was just a great example of not being at your best, but still winning a game in a, in a really tough environment versus a tough team. And so, um, yeah, you, you just stay with it. You, you just keep plugging and um, you keep trying to help each other. And now, you know, you, you step up and you have a good game and maybe that other person is, is going to be somebody that was helping you the night before that you have to help. And, you know, just the reciprocity of being a good teammate and, and being a good coach and, um, and understanding that, you know, you're, you're going to have some failure, but sometimes you can build off of that failure and even have more success because of it. By the column over here, Pete. Uh, Matt, Pete Thamel from uh, ESPN. I'm wondering if you could uh, just give us a little X and O insight, compare and contrast on the big man matchup. It's obviously going to be one of the focuses of the game on Monday in terms of Donovan and Zach. And maybe as the second part, reflect a little bit on your philosophy of staying with recruiting and developing big men like Zach when the trends of the game clearly have kind of gone away from that. Right. Yeah. You know, just for us, it's, it's circling the wagons around our best players. You know, if that's Carson Edwards, so be it. You know, when we came three-tenths of a second from going to a Final Four in that game, you know, we didn't play post-up basketball. You know, we, you know, we, we tried to do as much stuff in space, and, and he was so good and dynamic that we just we let it rip. And um, people don't realize with that team that he really struggled in, at the end in the Big Ten, even though we won the Big Ten that year. We really struggled. We got beat in the first round of the Big Ten tournament. Um, he didn't shoot well the last couple games of the season after really shooting well. And then going into the tournament, you know, he became the darling of the tournament. You know, his last three games, he made 10, 9, and 8 threes. But going in, you know, we just felt we had a lot of makes coming our way. And it, it could go the other way, right? So we just tried to circle it around our best guys. We've just had a lot of big guys. But we've still had some pretty dynamic guards from Echuan Moore to Jaden Ivey to Carson Edwards. Obviously, we have good guards on this team. Um, but just trying to play through them and their strengths and, and keep building off of that. The one thing I think that we do a better job than most people with it is we make them decision makers. Because if you're going to get the ball a lot, you know, yesterday, like, Zach had some turnovers. And, like, you know, now let's watch those turnovers. Let's look at it. Let's see what they're doing. Let's learn from that. No different than a point guard. You know, Braden had some turnovers yesterday. So let's watch that and see, you know, the mistakes that you're making and then just grow from that. because. Even when you start to have success in certain areas, it's, it can still rear its ugly head. And great teams will, you know, they will enhance that with their pressure or their size or their length. But, you know, both players are really good. I, I think the important piece of it also is not to neglect who UConn brings off the bench too. Because John's he's a really good player. You know, their backup is a really good player. He, you know, he, he gets out in ball screen defense. He's active. He gets great. He does a great job on his flip up dunks. You know, he just they have a they have a superb system. I love their system. I love what they do. Um, they have purpose in what they do on both ends. But they everybody defends on that team. You know, like you're not allowed to play, right? If you can't guard, you can't play. So it's like one of those deals, like old school. And um, but no, like, like Klingon is really good. Like, you know, he changes the game defensively, but offensively he's a good player too. You know, he, but he, he's, he's just going to keep coming. He's going to be a fabulous player. He's got 15 to 20 years in front of him. Um, but don't take anything away from other guys on that front line because they're all good players. On the right side, Eddie. Hey, Coach, uh, Eddie Pels with AP. I, we're, I know we've, you've heard you talk a lot about we're kind of more in an instant gratification world of college sports. Was there a a time when you either you, you as a kid or a player or as a coach where you, where you just realize like it, it's just going to I can live with myself more if I'm honest with players as opposed to yeah. telling them whatever they want to get them over here. Yeah, yeah, no no question about it. Like I would like break down things and my assistants would like be like if you keep going this route we'll have nobody on our team. Like, your honesty is, like, killing us. Like, and that was about 10, 12 years ago, and I just said, yeah, but when we get them, it's easier to coach them, you know? And so just, like, like be a truth teller. I, I think there's a lot of people out there 
that understand that and feel that. But I just put the caveat on it, and the guys that cover us all the time has heard it a hundred times. But just if you become one of our top two or three scorers, here's my vision for you. If you don't, then you're going to have to be able, from a role definition standpoint, fit around those guys offensively. So what happens in recruiting is guy, you can have a two-year relationship and you can talk about your role, and not one time do they talk about defense. Pretty important part of the game, huh? So if you get there and you can't handle pressure and you can't play without turning it over because you handle pressure by just shooting before and then you can't guard your man or you don't even know like what county he's in, you know, it's going to be really hard to play you on a, on a really good college basketball team. So you'll see, like, talented guys. That's why you see a lot of talented one-and-done guys. The guys that are one-and-done that come in that are like Carmelo Anthony, like, they are rare. He functional, win a national championship. Like, that is hard. A lot of the one-and-done guys, like, on their talent, like, they get there, and now it's really hard for them because now they're being asked to do some things that they've never had to do. You see it a lot in the portal. You'll, you'll go get a low, mid, low to mid-major player that's averaged 20 points somewhere, and he's going to come to your place. If he can stay in that role and average 20 points, he can have a little bit more rope, a little bit more freedom, because that's what a leading scorer gets. You don't like to say that, but that's just the truth. You know, it's just, just the way it is. You're going to be able to play through your mistakes more when you can go get us 20. But if that guy that averaged 20 at that level now comes to a high level and now he's going to average like four to ten points for you, like now all the things you harp on is what the previous coach harped on, but he just kept him in the game because he needed his 20 points. Now I don't need some joker that's averaging five points for me to get beat back door on two different plays. It's like, hey, man, get him out of there. Whereas the guy who gets beat back door that, you know, averages 25, you're like, hey, man, can we not get beat back door while he's running back down the court? Like, you know, so um, that, that is um, the contradiction of coaching, right? That's just, it's just the way it is. But we all search for a role. That's what we want. Like nobody says, hey, man, I hope I can come to your place and play about 10 minutes and set screens and rebound. Like, you know what I mean? That'd be cool, you know. We'd like to welcome to the dais at this time Mason Gillis and Fletcher Lawyer will join us from Purdue as well. Let's take a question in the third row, second seat in. Uh, Matt Adi Joseph, CBS Sports. What what do you see as the uh, the backcourt size disadvantage that your team has in this championship game with Castle and Newman um, versus Braden and Lance? Yeah. How do you how do you want to play into that? Do you, does that change your strategy at all? Yeah. Well, I think we have a disadvantage if they make poor decisions. I don't think it's a disadvantage if we make good decisions. You know, they swarm you, they get into you, they make it difficult on you. Don't put yourself in di difficult scenarios. Take care of the basketball, run our stuff, you know, make good decisions. They, those guys are really good at pressure. And Stephen Castle, on down the line, you know, when they sub, they're good. Like all those guys can pressure, take care of the basketball, make good decisions, run what we've called, and, and stick with that. If, if we do those things, you know, you'll have success. What they do a great job of is when blood's in the water. When you show weakness or you turn your back on pressure or you dribble in place, um, you know, you leave your feet, you don't play on two feet, those guys are the best in the business. They, they will make you pay. And like I said earlier, that's, that's two or three points at the end, at the other end of the court. So I think that's important for us, and that's our challenge. Just handle pressure, take care of the basketball, make good decisions. Because they, they'll get into you, and they're solid, but they're just waiting for you to do something stupid. Don't do something stupid. Back left, Dana. Hold the microphone out, please, so Dana can take it. Thank you. Uh, Dana O'Neill, The Athletic. Matt, you talked about the turnovers. I guess, you know, the glass half empty is that they turned it over the glass half full as you got through it. Um, just the evolution of this team's composure this season, how has it worked out and kind of where are they in it, do you think? Right. I, I thought we did a good job um, of kind of playing through it. Um, we offset it by going 10 for 25 from three. So you throw a five for 25 on top of that, you get beat. And that's where we've lost in the past. We've lost in the past because of high turnovers, high volume of threes and low percentage. We can take a high volume of threes in a low percentage and then have eight turnovers and still win a game but we can't do the three for 23 and the 17 turnovers. That's a recipe for disaster. So like they understand that. I've, I've talked those numbers to them the whole season, but it's also the functionality of play. 
like being able to handle someone's pressure, being able to take care of the basketball. And, you know, we had a couple elementary turnovers. Um, we overdid our dribbling a couple times. We, our, our spacing wasn't good. In a couple of those scenarios, that was on me in terms of our post action and what we do when the ball goes inside. Um, but, like, we've played, you know, the, this whole season, and we, we've seen a lot of different looks. I think this is, the, this is the biggest challenge for us on the biggest stage, and that's what you want. Like, you know, you, you want to be able to do that. And uh, like, like I said earlier, just being functional in what we do is the most important. Up front on the left side, Myron. Matt, in a climate where a lot of bigs want to be versatile, don't want to be called centers, how hard is it to find guys like Zach Eady in the current climate? Yeah, it, it's very difficult because most big guys that, are, that size aren't very good at basketball. You know, if you go look at the numbers across the board, you know, like how many other players are, are good at 7 4, 300, but there's not very many of them out there, period. You know, so, you know, we, we, we scour the earth for size. You know, we, we, we try to go out there and get it because it's, it's proven. Um, if you can work with it, I think we have a, a great assistant in Brandon Brantley that's done a great job with those guys that, that gives a lot of time and film and individual instruction. And then you got to, you got to offset it with skill. So, like, both of these guys to my right, you know, just didn't come to Purdue and learn how to shoot. Like, these guys were great shooters before. They're, they're, they're high. So, if you can get high-level competitors that are skilled, both of these guys are very, very competitive, but they're also maniacal in their work. So, it's not something I got to check on because I found out that's who they are no matter what. So, like, if they would have went to another school, they would still work on their game. Right, a lot of times people say, hey, "Through our development, and we did this, and we did this." And I think that's bullshit. You know, a lot of times, like these guys did it. Like, give them credit. It's a player's game. You know, and I think that's an important piece to really embrace in coaching. I'm yet to see somebody come up here and get interviewed all the time with bad players. Right, right. It's a, it's a player's game, man. These guys are great players. They're good, but we also have to piece it together. You know, they sacrifice too. Like, they can do more than they actually do, but they're playing with a guy that now they, they get role definition. So Fletch might get 12 rips at it. He might get six. You know, Mason has games where he shoots the ball two or three times. Sometimes he shoots the ball seven or eight times. What it, you know, if you want to let him play one-on-one, -on -one, we'll play one-on-one. -on -one. If you don't, then we're going to pass the ball. But they need to pass the basketball too, and they pass it way more than he does, and rightfully so. But, like, that's just – it's in a system – that they know that they can flourish in and we feel that they can flourish in. Now, when he moves and we change, like how will that, you know, you know that, that, that's the difference. But um, we won games before that too. We have a number of questions for Coach Painter in only a few more minutes, but we do need to get one in for the student athletes from Purdue. If you have a question for Mason, we'll go to Zach in the center of the room. Or Fletcher. Zach Brazil of your post. For either of the player, you obviously played a lot of very good teams this year. Is there anyone you've played that you would say is comparable to UConn, or are they in a class by themselves in terms of your opponents this year? Mason first, please, then Fletcher. Um, I don't know necessarily how to classify them in their own kind of class, but they won the national championship last year. They deserve the respect that they've gotten, and we've done our work to get here. They've done their work to get here. And the thing about the game that we have Monday is that it's two great programs, two great cultures, two great coaches going at it, and the players are going to do their best. That's what we can do. We don't necessarily worry about comparing them to other teams. It's just we have to do our job. Fletcher. Yeah, kind of like Mason said, you don't really compare them. You kind of compare your, uh, what you're going to bring to the table, how you're going to get ready to play. Uh, you got to get ready as if it's to win the Big Ten, as if it's, uh, if it's to win the national championship, bigger stage. So just getting ourselves ready. Obviously, they're a great team. They made it here uh, second year in a row. That's very impressive. And uh, so giving them the respect, but making sure we're ready to go. This will be the final question for this session to the left. Uh, Israel Schumann from the Purdue Exponent. Matt, you brought in a new um, <clears throat> strength and conditioning coach a couple years ago, Jason Cabo. Um, what did what did he bring, you know, in terms of impact, and what has he kind of changed with the way you guys prepare physically? Yeah. And then Mason can also weigh in on this. Yeah, no, he's done a, a, a great job. You know, he has got good rapport with our guys. Um, very experienced. You know, been in the background. Has worked with a lot of high-level college guys, high-level pros, being at UNLV. You know, 
few NBA players go through Vegas in, in the offseason, guys. I don't know if you knew that. Um, but, like, he's worked with a lot of different people um, at a very, very high level. These guys can speak on it. I can let Mason speak on it because they work directly with him. And, uh, you know, but more than anything, of, of just – having a good rapport with guys and trying to help them in their own situation. There's a lot of things that are similar in what we do with each guy, but there's a lot of differences, right? Like what Zach Eady does and what Fletch does, there's going to be some differences. I think that's the key thing is, is to help each guy, you know, improve their strengths and their weaknesses. Sometimes guys just want to dive into what they struggle in when there's some things in the weight room that are strengths, you know, you want to keep enhancing. Go ahead, Mason. You wanted Mason to take that too. Like Coach said, his experience has shown over the two years. I think whenever he first came into our program, he did a good job of learning who we were, learning how to work with us. And like Coach said, everybody's different. And so anytime you're new to a program, you have to learn that. And I think he did a good job of going to each of us, talking to each of us, figuring out our weaknesses, figuring, figuring out our strengths. And we've grown with that over the course of the two years that he's been with us. He's really been able to isolate what Zach needs to do a couple days before the game to get him feeling the best. He has learned what I need to do, whether that's more on some days, less on some days, um, specific exercises and things like that. Like Coach talked about, he's been around. He's been through things and it always helps when you've seen things personally. Um, you can't compare anything to real life experience and him bringing that into our culture uh, it just helps us, helps us grow. Um, and he's a good guy, too. He's able to converse with us outside of the locker room. Um, he's had us over to his house to have food, and so he's done his best, his best to get us here to the national championship. We'd like to thank Mason, Fletcher, and Coach Painter for joining us here in the main interview room. Mason and Fletcher and other of Purdue's starting five will join us in the breakout area in just a few moments at 1220. That's to my right and your left, the Purdue